Okay, thank you very much. And we hope with our technical difficulties, is assuming that the Satan has a good thing to stop. That's always what you hope. I remember the Sadim Narav used to say a story that there was a Yid who came to blow Shoifer, and he came onto the Bima, and he, his face was fiery red, and he took the talus and threw it over his head, and he started to blow, and nothing came out. Kia, nothing came out. Shwaram Trua, nothing, nothing was happening. And finally, uh, I didn't know what to do. So somebody jumped up and said, I know what to do. He lifted the talus and exposed his face and said, now blow. And the Baal, uh, right away, they said, the Baal Makra said, Kia, like a song. Shwaram Trua, like a song. <coughs> and they asked him what happened. Like, well, how did the idea work? Does it have to do with air pressure, maybe, because his <laughs> face was covered with a talus, no circulation of the air. The guy said, no, what are you hacking a China? He told him that uh, the Sultan saw this guy, you know, with the talus over his head, shaking back and forth. He was so scared. He said, who knows who's blowing over here? He's going to bring Mashiach. Boy, I better stop this. He said, we lifted the towel. So, oh, you. Make it blow, blow all you want. He said, that's our work. Okay. So we hope that when there's technical difficulties, uh, that means that the Sultan, when something goes too good, you know that there's always, always an issue. Okay, Rabbi Sam. Um, it is brought down in the Sefer Or Zeruah, who is, of course, one of the Rishonim, and he was actually the Rebbe of the Maharami Rottenberg. And the story is also brought down in the Matamosha, uh, it was a Talmud of the Marshal, and they say the following story, that there was a Shamis who came into a Beis HaMedrash. Shamis comes into the Beis HaMedrash in the morning. This Shamis, as you know, Shamis alone is very hard to make Parnassa, so he used the moonlight. He wasn't just the Shamis, uh, he was also the official undertaker that used to bury people. So he comes into the Basin Medrash and he, like, he does a double take. He thinks, that is, that he notices a person that he buried last night <laughs> is like wandering around the Basin Medrash, which is always a shtickle problem, as you may understand. It, it makes for things a little bit confusing. So, uh, given the situation, he said to him, What are you doing here? The Shamus has a way with words, as you know. Uh, he just said to him, Why are you here? Just, uh, <coughs> the Sutton didn't stop yet. He's still trying. Okay, he got the camera going, but. Uh, okay. We will not be in a spell. We will attempt to forge on. <laughs> just don't try too hard, Sutton, because. Uh, we don't have that much. Anyway, so uh, he says to him, what are you doing here? Now, not only was the man there, he also had a grass crown around his head, which is, of course, made it look very interesting. Uh, so the, the shaman is, is like trying to figure this out. He buried the guy last night. He's wandering around the shul today. So he, he figured there was a variety of possibilities. Could be he was not getting enough sleep. Sometimes that's what you see when you don't get enough sleep. Uh, could be that this shaman in his unbelievable loyalty to the Beis HaMedrash, whenever someone gave Tikkun, especially the Polish Ezek the uh, 96 proof, he would taste it before to make sure it wasn't poisoned or something, you know. So it could be he was over-tasting a little bit. Um, he also thought that maybe this person is not real. Maybe this person is a shade, maybe he's a Sheen Dalit, you know, maybe he's some kind of a ghost or something. Uh, maybe this is the Oilam Hadimian. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but there is such a thing called the Oilam Hadimian, which means in the Shema could be in Shemayim. He doesn't even know he's in Shemayim. Now, I remember when uh, I was in uh, grade school, Chayder, so the Rebbe was saying, you know, some people are in the Oilam Hadimian, they don't even realize they're not in the real life. So one boy said, how do I know that, Rebbe, you're not in the Oilam Hadimian now? Like, how do we know that what you told us now is a uh, thing? I don't know we're not in the Oilam Hadimian. So he answered him as follows. He said to him, that, uh, did you do, I remember the Rebbe said this, did you do a chesed for someone today? He said, yeah. He said, in the Oilam Adin, you don't get a chance to do a chesed for people. Only on this world do you have that opportunity. So if you did a chance to do someone a favor today, then you know you're not on the Oilam Adin, and you know you are on the real world. Okay, so I guess this shamus realized that he is in the real world. So he said to the person, he asked him a very logical question. He said to him, didn't I bury you last night? So the guy said, yeah. He said, I came back. And he even showed him his tachrichim, and he showed him that he had a rip, a rip in one of the sleeves. And the guy remembered making a rip in one of the sleeves. 
So he said to him, the next day, you're ready back? You don't have any problems in Shemayim? He said, zero. I had no problems in Shemayim. You know? I went right, easy pass. I went right through. So the shaman said to him, but you're such a simpleton. Also, Shemassim have a way with words. Uh, he said, you're just a simple guy. You know, you went right through, right through all the gates with nothing. Mamish like there. Okay, can't resist saying this one. You all know this, I'm sure. That somebody comes up to Shemayim, and they say, no din v'cheshben, right in. Right in. The Malach is taking him to Gan Eden. He says, wow, right to Gan Eden. He says, I haven't had a case like this in years, hundreds of years. What did you do? He was like to this. He tells him, he was driving on the Palisades Parkway, and uh, he saw this yeshiva guy stuck trying to change his tire, and this motorcycle gang surrounded him, and uh, he went over, he saw this yeshiva guy's in trouble, he screeched, drove onto the median, went over to the guy, this big guy with bulging muscles, huge ta- tattoos, of, you know, the pirate symbol on his uh, bulging muscles, on his sleeveless leather jacket, he got a long ponytail, he says, a uh, huge 600 pounder, he says, I went over to him, I grabbed him by his ponytail, he yanked him, and I said, leave this yeshiva bucker alone. I said, wow, what mysterious nefesh. So they asked him, they said, when did this happen? He said, about 30 seconds ago. He said, that's uh, when it happened. Okay. So he asked him, he said, I don't understand you. He said, you're, uh, you're such a simple person. How did they let you come right down the next day in Shemayim? He didn't go through the whole Indian of Din that it says in the Swarim. So he answered, all kidding aside, he answered that I always was very careful throughout my life to make brachas slowly and to make brachas, I think that the lotion, I don't remember the exact lotion, but koil noyim, it's a very sweet koil, and uh, therefore I got easy pass to Shemai. So he asked him, uh, what's with the grass uh, crown on your head? So he told him that that's like a uh, kind of a perfume. He says, why exactly you need a perfume on your head? He said, once you're in Shemayim, if you would know what this world smells like, you can't even survive it. So I need this on my head. So I want to discuss this for a few minutes, because I said this story once to some of my Bachrim and Yeshiva, and this kid asked me a good question. He said, you know, if so many people have these loopholes and they go right into Gan Eden, so why am I working so hard trying to figure out this Tysus? Like, if there's so many easy ways to get in, you know, there's this story, there's the famous mud story, there's uh, the Hale Garijana came, and he wanted to come in with his Hasidim to a certain house, and they told him, the guy said, no, 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 no. just repolstered and redo the carpet. They said, it's a storm outside, and we're in the middle of a woods, and there's no place to go, you're not coming into this house. You're schlepping the mud, I know you guys. The Rebbe could come in. All right, so the Rebbe came in, the Rebbe said, I want to tell you a story. He said, a story was, and he tells him a whole story of a person who did not live a very good life, and in Mina Shemayim Oiva, he was destined to uh, big trouble. And one day he's taking somebody on a trip, and all of a sudden he hears screaming and screaming, and he really doesn't want to stop because it's in the middle of the night and he's driving full force. And if he stops, it could be an ambush. But he thinks the whole family is about to go over a cliff. He jumps up, jumps into the mud, he's waist high in the mud, the mud is up to his neck, and with his tremendous kayak, he schleps the wagon out, ties it to ropes, rescues the whole family person by person. After he comes up to Shemayim, so they put all his Avevers on one side of the scale, Grois and Suez, big time. They put whatever mitzvah, pop, pop, on the right side of the scale, it ain't registering too much. And this guy says, Simen is git. And he is desperately looking for some of those malachim that are going to carry him over, but uh, no, it doesn't work that way, always. So finally they said, oh, he has this one mitzvah, the malach comes running, and they take the horse, and the buggy, and the mountain, they put everything on the mitzvah side, still doesn't outweigh his Averis. I mean, this was a guy without any filters on any of his phones or anything, so <laughs> this side was very heavy, if you know what I mean. So at the end, what they did was, they, they scratched together the mud that he went into, and they put the mud on the mitzvah side of the scale. And with all the mud, it scraped more and more, and it was almost, 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 a mash of more mud, it would have been out of the woods, but uh, they ran out of mud. So they told the guy, you're in big trouble. So they said, listen, but he was so close, so close, they said, he's going to come down to this world. And if he's masking him to go into mud to help another person, so very good, I'll have his Yeshua. It'll be Mitzar of the mud, from this Gilgul to the mud in the previous Gilgul. It's G'day Tzirah. And if mud is going to be the reason that he doesn't want to have a Shachas with anybody, so Atkan, that's where it ends. So he says, that's the original, why are you telling me this story? So he says, well, you happen to be that person. 
And you see what's happening now? You're not letting, you're going to let all these people freeze outside in the pouring rain because you don't want them to bring mud into your house. So he, in desperation, he didn't care what his wife had to say, he ran out and holding onto his chest, he yelled at the top of his lungs, he said, see them, come in, come in and do me a favor. He says, dig up as much mud as you can and bring it in, pile it on, pile it on. So this kid asked me a very good question. So you have all these stories, you know, so like, why, why is he working so hard? And then he said, which is really, we should address this question. Uh, I also had this once on a different occasion, where someone said, you know, whatever I said, uh, the boy's name, open your Gemara. Ah, I'm not in the mood. You know that Hashem pays double when you're not in the mood. So, Rabbi, yesterday you said, when you learn B'Simcha, Hashem pays double. Now you're saying, when you're not in the mood, Hashem pays double. Isaiah pays double for both. So another kid said, so really, there, there's never a time that there's double of what? Because when you're happy, you get double. When you're not happy, you get double. So what's the double? Double of what? There's no regular. No one's ever regular to get double. Where, where, where's the thing? Right? Same with davening. You're not in the mood of davening. You're davening, you get paid double. Ah, then again, you daven the simcha, you get paid double. So either way, you get paid double. So it's not double, it's the same one. It's, it's, it's what it is, right? It keeps going. There's no more... Uh... So, let's, let's try to address that a little bit. The uh, Sam Seifer says, he explains the Mishnah, have a Zahir, the Mitzvah Kala. Be careful even with a Mitzvah Kala, with an easy Mitzvah, what is considered to be a lighter Mitzvah. You don't know the Schar of Mitzvahs. Zaktach Sam Seifer, what does that mean? Because you cannot understand that your attitude toward a Mitzvah doubles and triples and quadruples the points. And therefore, it's not so much the Mitzvah. That's what the mission means, have a Zohir the mitzvah kala. Because when a Shemayim, they're not looking at the mitzvah itself as much as they are looking who you are at this moment when you are performing the mitzvah. And therefore, as we have mentioned many times, Reb Chaim Belazhener says that in the history of this world, since Sheish is made Bereshis, there never were two Shemonesers that are the same. No two Shemonesers are alike. Why? Well, it's the same words. Open a Siddur. Okay, Ashkenaz Vard has some differences. All right, uh... You say the Yatzvach Bekane, you don't say the Yatzvach Bekane. You know, there was this Chesidah uh, Shingaman, he walked into, a, I don't know, Ashkenazish place, uh, and he realized by Kaddish, he said the Yatzvach Bekane. Everyone began to scream, no, 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 no! He said, he said, I promise, I didn't mean it. He said, I didn't mean it, I said it, but I didn't mean it. You know, I said the Yatzvach Bekane, I didn't really want it. Like, don't get so excited. Okay. So, I'll go upon him. No, it says not to be marba, the halacha says not to be marba the Kaddish. Because if you, the more Kadeshim you say, the less you have the proper Kavona that you should in regard to it. So it happened, they say this, uh, somebody's by the Kaisel, this, I don't know, this Chacham, and he's saying Kaddish after Kaddish after Kaddish. Every time he hears a Mishnah, of Baraisa, dissidents. So he takes that Shulchan Aruch, he goes over to him, he says, Katuv Bahalacha, that you're not allowed to be Marbe Bekadesh, he goes, Zehalacha? Ken, oh, it's Kadari, it's Kadari, it's Kadari, it's Kadari, Some people only see things their way. All right, so there are no two Shmon Esrei's that are alike, okay? Maybe different Esrei's, but there are no two Shmon Esrei's that are alike. What does Rechaim Velazhner mean? That since Sheish is Hume Bereshis, there were no two Shmon Esrei's that are alike. When you stepped out Shmon Esrei today and you began davening Marev, or if you will be davening Marev, or if you forgot to daven Marev, you should. So, generally speaking, if we look at the, ga- the, the gambit of human emotions, when everyone starts a Shmon Esrei, usually there is some issue going on within it that may be a stira or a contradiction to davening. It may be an issue of taiva. He has to battle his machshavites. It may be an issue of a munna on a variety of different levels. A munna in general. Uh, a munna as to how potent is my tefillah anyway. Does my tefillah really work? All right? You've got to believe your tefillah really works. The more you believe your tefillah works, the more it works. I think I told you the story earlier this year that this uh, young kid, you know, this story goes back in the 19, uh, late 50s. No, no email, no uh, text messaging, no phone cards. So the communication from here to Eretz Yisrael was uh, tough. So this guy, he learns in Brisk, and uh, he's by the Kaisel. Obviously, couldn't be better after 69, 7. Okay, it's 1968, let's say the story. <laughs> so he's by the Kaiso, and uh, unless it was before 48, but I don't think it's not going to stand anyway. So uh, this is what he watched. So he watches this kid come with a backpack and, you know, big long hair and all sides. Real, uh, the real that generation, you know, the 60s, uh, 
Then he's gone, he's standing by the wall, and he says, God, God, if you are real, if you are real, I want you to answer me. I want you to answer me whether or not the Jets won today. Because he had no way of knowing. So these two brisky guys are listening, and they're like, uh, they say, let's have some fun. So they make a quick call to New York, even though it costs $20. They find out that the Jets won by 10 points. And as he's like backing off from the Kaisal, he goes over, pats him on the back. Hello, who are you? Yeah, hi. He says, hi. I'd like to meet you. He says, you know, I saw the way you were praying. I was so inspired, really. Yeah. You know, I, I get these inspirations, like God comes to me. God comes to you? Yeah. <laughs> what did he tell you? He told me to tell you that the Jets won by 10 points. And he's ah! And he's like, oh, he's <laughs> unbelievable. He runs over, so... They came back, so I forgot who the Rosh Hashiva was. The boys are laughing. He says, what are you laughing? He says, what are you making fun of? What are you chaffing? This guy's looking for his money. You're making fun of him. And then he told them, in a typical brisker fashion, he said, you didn't touch up the nicer right. You missed the whole point of the story. They said, this is the story. Why do you miss the whole point of the story? The whole point is, are you diving? I want to know what the team, if the team won or not. Someone should tell him. And what happened? They managed to put this mishagas in your head to make the shtick. But the bottom line is, he got his answer. He asked for something, he got it. You know, you, you, you're forgetting that. Every sincere tefillah is answered. So there's the potency of our tefillah that we deal with. Sometimes there's personal anger in a person's life, and it's hard to damage monastery. Sometimes there's a sense of foreboding, a depression, phobias, fears. Does God like me? Uh, an ex acceptance. Sometimes people are in the mood, they're taking advantage of them. A person feels he has no sip book. Uh, family issues that are going on. Or uh, what a guy tell me, they're asking this kid why he went off. And he said, it was like, it to me, it took advantage of me, my rabbi. Like, give me an example of how they took advantage of you. Like, what was the mark of a path? She goes, by Kiddush Levana, I was always the one that had to carry in all the cards, you know, the Kiddush Levana cards into the base madras. You know, that was his big problem, okay? <laughs> Everyone has their thing. I don't know if that story is true or not, as someone told me. But our Kopanim, we all have our issues, depending on our mood. And of course, all of these issues, seriously speaking, subdivides on various different in, in, in intensities. So, Lemaisa, when you start davening Shmanesa, you're dealing with one of these issues. And you're never dealing with it on the same level. And you're dealing with a mix of these issues. So who you are at, it, at any given Shmon Esrei, who you are on any given day that you open the black Gemara is not the same person, because those mix of emotions change. So you've been learning that for Yaimi, you've been doing this for almost seven and a half years, it's not the same blah, it's not the same blah because it's not the same blah, but what the, the point is you're not the same person. And therefore the schar that you get from Limit Torah depends on what obstacles you overcame to be able to daven, to be able to learn, to be able to smile, to be able to put on Big Day Shabbos, and your schar is directly connected. There could be a person that is dealing with all of the above. Although that's hardly likely. Your tzaddik says in the Sefer Tzibka Tzaddik, other places as well, that the predominant negative forces, tangible negative forces within the human person that our neshama struggles with, is either kas, anger, or taiva. He says, although they overlap, but generally a person that's into taiva is not so into anger. A person that's into anger is not so into taiva. But he says, either way, they're both tangible realities. And when a person sequesters the anger that is within him, it's not just that the kas disappears. That tangible reality of kas is converted into bracha. He brings some the uh, the and then the others say that when a person has an assignment of anger, best anger management is this is top dollar. You you squash that anger, it is converted into cold cash. It's a metzius of cold cash. I see this guy walking up and down the avenue, poor guy, I don't know if this is his job. He's wearing this sign that says cash for gold, gold for cash, like something, you know, poor guy back and forth. It's, 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 we don't realize that we're, we're, this is cash for gold. And the same is true for taiva. The taiva is a tangible reality that drives a person. And when you sequester that taiva, taiva doesn't disappear. It is changed into a form of bracha. That's why Yisav Tzadik was the king of the world. And, and, and it's the greatest school for parnasa that is shaykh. Now, it's also possible that a person doesn't have any of the emotions that we just spoke about. He is in big trouble if he doesn't have any of the emotions. Because that means he's not alive. Okay? Uh, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. But an EKG that is a straight line is not a very good thing. It's a very short distance between the two points, from the beginning to the end. Somebody once told me before a drasha, he said, Sign, symbol of a good darshan, he said, is a good beginning, and a good gishmaka end, and the shortest distance in between those two. Yeah. Shortest distance. Okay? <laughs> so it, we all are dealing with one of those emotions one way or another. And Mimela, 
have a zar the mitzvah kala, because you and a chanami. There's different levels of mitzvahs. There's different levels of averus. You know that this is a chiyuv and this is bezness, a chiyuv krisis, a chiyuv malchus. This is a, but it, you are there, there's a different cycle that works along with that, and that is who are you when you're not in the mood of performing the mitzvah and you overcome that anger, you overcome that sense of what's the point, you overcome after a trauma and you say I'm going to keep trying, I'm going to keep going, I'm going to open the gemara and come back and continue my life. So the Rebbein Hashem doesn't measure the mitzvah. The Rebbein Hashem measures who you are. And therefore the Chesam Seifer says, be careful. Have a zahir the mitzvah kaw. Now, there's a cycle of these emotions that take place in the course of our lives. Uh, somebody showed me an article, there's a whole to-do, yesterday, today, tomorrow, I couldn't tell you. But something, some people are out there looking at Venus. Venus is cutting off the sun. Something like that. There's a dot between the sun and Venus, something? Yes. Episode, so yesterday, right. Yeah, I told my neighbor it was tonight. Poor guy was standing in the rain looking up. <laughs> right, like, right, I got to apologize to him. But. So they said that it happens twice in a hundred years. Whatever this is. I don't, I don't know what it is. Whatever it is. So now, just imagine if every single night you went out there to look at the sun, right? And after 50 years you say, Oh no! The world's coming to an end! Look! This never happened before! You never saw it. But it's not really something, it's the Divine Shalom knows exactly what's happening. It's going with the Cheshman. There are events sometimes that happen in our lives that say, this never happened before. God dropped me. He didn't drop you. This is part of the Cheshman of your life. You just never saw it before. So there's an Indian of called Makabal of Oil Malch, uh, Oil, Oil Taira, Mavir Nimenu Oil Malchus. Meaning to say that if I'm dealing with an emotional challenge within me, and I'm not in the mood of davening, and I'm not in the mood of learning, because Baruch understands that. However, when you force the, the avoidance Hashem on you, what happens is, yes, it may be difficult to learn. Yes, it may be difficult to daven. But some of the difficulty that you would have to endure regardless is transferred over into the yegiyah of the mitzvah. So Rav Moshe came to the Chavetz Chaim and said, and he was drafted into the Russian army in those years, was a virtual death sentence, especially for a Jew. So Rav Moshe, the Chavetz Chaim told him, I'm a oil So he said, I was already drafted. So, he, it, so the Chavetz Chaim said, it says, Mavirin. What does Mavirin mean? They take it away. There's a transfer. In other words, there's a certain amount of Agnes Nefesh a person has to go through in his life, Rahman al Islam. So you can say, I'm not in the mood of davening, you're not in the mood of learning. It's a very foolish Cheshbin. Because it may be very hard for you to daven or hard for you to learn. But as you're starting to daven and as you're starting to learn or as you're starting to smile by your Shabbos table or raising your kids or whatever your Nesayin is, you're not going to suffer any more because of this. All you're doing is you're transferring the Agnes Nefesh you would have had anyway into the mitzvah where you're being rewarded tenfold for that. Uh, I heard from a Melch Biederman, he says he knows the person firsthand that uh, there was a woman in her 50s, late 50s, early 60s, that uh, she was diagnosed with terrible machla and Rahman al-Islam. And the tzaddik of Shlomk of Zavil told her that he has a Yeshua for her, but it has to be as follows. He told her not to reveal it in her lifetime. And uh, he, he told her not to wear any jewelry, told her not to go to any child's simcha, no wedding, not to hug or kiss any of her grandchildren. And uh, she lived in her high 90s. So in other words, so the tzaddik said, what was the cheshbin? So whatever it is, she used up her, her simcha on this world, so by holding it off, so memela, it extended her life. Now, it's a very dangerous concept, and it's not something we should get into, unless you're a big tzaddik, and you know exactly what to say. Um, I mean, the, the Shlomke had used to say to this, this to people very often, you're going you're gonna to go out and buy yourself a brand new car, and enjoy it. You know, that has to be the latest model, upgrade to the latest phone. I don't want to put a filter on my phone. I want, I want, to, have, I want to be free. You know, there's only a certain amount of free that you have. You're going to consume it here. You won't have it in different areas. So somebody, one of his gaboyim was all ice men. She said, what happened? He says, he lost his watch. You know, those days a watch was hard to come by. So he said to him, did you have extra hanaf from something? So he said, they got new drapes in his house. And he was like, quelling on these drapes. So he said, well, that's what you lost your watch. You've got to realize that this is the way it works. There's a certain amount that you're going to have. You have to decide how to use it. That's really how Rashi in the Sechdes Bay explains. Comes in ice of Shalat and Skitzuvim like Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah. All your Mazinus goes from one Rosh Hashanah to the next. If you're going to buy a jacuzzi on day number one, and you can't afford it, you may not have enough money for bread. In other words, there's a certain amount that we have to work with. Now, let's take this a step further. A person sometimes makes a simple, a lot of chasanas. This, Baruch Hashem. Right, this time period before the summer, after Shavuos, and I've heard so many times from Bali Simcha, 
Why can't I make a simcha without Agmas Nefesh? Ugh. This person is assaulted, that person is assaulted. The invitation goes to the wrong person. Comes to the story, as God was telling you all about. You know, like I said, yeah, we don't learn a lesson. Like, why, why the caterer and his wife is upset, the husband's upset, the machutin's upset, the machutin is upset, Allah. Why, why, why? why? So I made so many weddings. Never worked out perfectly. Chacham. Maybe this is the reason you're zaycha to be by the weddings. Because the Rabbanisham has a whole cheshbin to make sure that you're there when the stargazer told Rabbi Akiva, your daughter is going to die the night of her wedding. And uh, she's sitting there and this poor person walks in. Everybody wants to bounce him out. And she runs over and gives away her portion to him. And later she's sitting on her wicker chair or whatever it is, the collar chair, and she takes the, her hairpin and mm-hmm. sticks it in. And, goes, ah! and she kills the scorpion that was about to kill her. And that, that, what does that mean? It, it meant that there's a, there, there are nesyonis. And these nesyonis in a time of simcha is what gives the simcha gives us the license to be there by the Simcha. It's the greatest gift in HaShemayim. We're not on the Madrigan of Shlom Kazavilla to tell, to know what to stay away from. So of course we want to enjoy the wedding. So you don't have to look look for Tzaras. But when they come, understand, and this is easier said than done, but when they come, understand, this is part of the gift. So, Remendel of work at Reza's yard said, I think, he said as follows. He said, a chassid has to learn how to fast when he eats. You have to learn how to do his bite of this. His bite of this means you go off in the woods, you're alone with your Hashem. You have to learn how to do his bite of this between people. And you have to learn how to do Gilgal Shalag. Sadiqim used to roll in the snow as a kapara for their Averis. You have to learn how to do it in a warm bed. Why? You have to fast while you eat, do his bite of between people, and do Gilgal Shalag in a warm bed. And I once saw a sign that said 15% off on all sterling silver. Little asterisk. Besides for sterling silver pieces in the store, like something like that. You know, uh, what do you mean? How do you, how do you fast when you eat? And how do you do as vital as between people? How do you do Gogol Shalak in a warm bed? In previous generations, I heard this from a lot of Gitti Yidin. You find Sadiqim went into Gullis, Rashi went into Gullis, the Shagas Arya went into Gullis, the Gro went into Gullis, as a kapara for their, their Averis, which would be our mitzvahs. He says, today we don't do that. We don't walk around with nails in our shoes. You know, we don't walk around with biting ants in us. Because today... Pshad is just live your life. There are enough nisyonis in the course of life that's Gilgul Shalak. So the guy goes to sleep at night and he's worried about something, or he's gone went through a difficult parsha and he's tossing and turning in bed. And each minute he's getting angry and angry, he wants to punch that pillow so hard. <laughs> Instead he gets off and he takes a cup of water, writes out an eighteen dollar check to a mayor Balanes, says a capital till and gets into bed. That's Gilgul Shalak in the warm bed. Is that you're not in the mood to come down to eat by the Shabbos table, and you're really, really upset, and you say, it's not, it's not the fault of my family. And you walk down there, and you paint a smile on your face. You're so not in the mood, mood of smiling. But you know, the Chaitis Lava says your face is a Rosh Hashanah you can't throw the garbage into the Rosh Hashanah you can't frown. And you literally paint a smile, force a smile onto your face, and you sit down, and that's fasting when you're eating. Right? You're in an environment which is not the proper environment. You've got to be there. But you say, I'm not going to let myself be pulled into this. That's his bitterness between people. That's our Nisayim in the course of our lives. Don't expect it to be perfect. And don't try to avoid who you are. What's that story? This kid comes home and there's chocolate all over his face. The mother says, what you? You, you, I don't want you to eat by the neighbor. Do you understand? You play by the neighbor and not ask for any food. Next day, she's by the neighbor, the mother takes out a chocolate cake, the kid goes, grabs a huge piece, chunks it, chucks it down. So this neighbor says, you know, says to this kid, you want a piece of cake, ask for cake. Don't do that. She goes, I can't. My mommy said not to ask for food, right? <laughs> Don't try, you know, accept. A certain level of acceptance. We, 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 we can ask, the says we can ask for everything. Just don't, don't grab things on your own when it's not time. You know, somebody once said, there's, there's uh, I was once talking to one of my uh, Rosh Hashivas, and I was saying, I had a difficulty with ever with, uh, with a kid. He said, you know, it's Tsar Gidl Bonham. So he told me, that's not Tsar Gidl Bonham. That's Gidl Bonham. That, that's what raising children is all about. Tsar Gidl Bonham is a problem. That's not a problem. And our interpretation of what's problems has to come down. We have to lower the net. Though so this is life. This is life that's a gift. Okay? But Gifter said the famous story. He was once on a plane, but one of the engines caught fire. So the stewardess announced that one of the engines caught fire, and everyone started panicking. They said, you know, we're making an emergency landing. And uh, he said, this guy yells out to one of the stewardesses. He yells, give me one more drink before I die! You know? That's so nice. What a way to do tshuva. Shamnu, bagadnu. Imagine what the Malachim is going to say about him, right, when he gets up to Shemai. Well, suffice to say that the plane landed safely, Baruch Hashem. 
But uh, so he equated that with a story, Rav Gifter, one of the Shmuzin, where somebody, before he was Nifter, he asked for a cup of wine. He says he wants to apologize to his body. All his life, he, he, uh, he, he didn't give his body much. Now he wants to be Mephiasin. Now, our Nisayan in our lives is give your body the drink of wine when it's appropriate. Adarab. Our Nisayan is when you're not in the mood of drinking to drink. And to realize, you know, it's not, there's, no, there's no instant answers to things. It doesn't work that way. Somebody once said, how do you know when a yeshiva is in big trouble? So when you put a dollar into the soda machine, and out comes a sign, Tisku You know, that's it. <laughs> right? You don't know, get the soda, it's Life goes on. What does guy say? I have no faith in my uh, psychic. They say, why? He says, he took my check. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work. There aren't any psychics. And a person has to be ready. There, 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 there's a time in life you have to make changes. If Belsky's was on Gazum Shabbat Fushlem, and Baruch Hashem came back to Yeshiva, David Shavai tells him. He said a story when he was a Bachar, he was assigned to take care of Reb Ruvain in the Smeh Shari. And Reb Ruvain had just suffered a stroke. And he was half paralyzed and. Uh, he was very nervous. He was trying to give him the Nagel Vassar, and he had this, uh, Rosh Hashiva had this involuntary, like, jerking sometimes. And his hand, like, jerked and knocked the Nagel Vassar out, and it splashed all over both of them. So he felt so bad, he felt like, you know. So, and Rosh, it was Shach was time. Or, so Rosh Hashiva started talking to him and said, how's everything? It was very hard for him to talk. How's yet? Well, Bruce says, you're enjoying Yeshivas. He realized he was intense. But now I heard that, that he added another part to the story. And it was Mamish Nagel Vassar. It was a little bit later on during davening, and he brought him the water, and he was wearing his twill. And the story happened, they all splashed up, imagine wearing his tilt. And he, he said he was a buck, he felt so bad. And Rashiva said, you know, let's change the topic. He says, How, how's it going? Yeshiva, you have good chavrusim. <coughs> so he told to somebody, he said, Rabruvin talked in his tilt? He said, One of the things he was fired about was not to talk in your tilt. He said, He was then 65, 70 years old since his bar mitzvah. All those decades, not once did he ever talk in his tilt. In the war, he never spoke in his tilt. But here he felt, there's a buck that still looks a little like lost. Let me comment on that. You know what I mean? You know the greatness in that story? You know what that means? Like, it's not, it's not an issue. It's not a, my way or the highway. Even being Adam Lamakim, it's what, what does the Rabbani Shem really want? Of course, they made him in a Shiloh. They were not going to the Halacha Shilohs of it. But, and and, and Reuven was a fierce Kanai, right? And here's an old man, sick Nebuch, that just got water splashed on his head. And what's he saying? I'm going to break a thing I had my whole life. But this is what a Kaddish Baruch Hu wants me to do now. Ah, but it's the opposite of what God... No, no, if this happens, it's what God wants me to do now. But I never did this before. Venus was never in front of the thing. There's rotations in this world. That's how it works. They once said the government used to force them to make an appointed, to have an appointed rav. So they say once that uh, the government came by, the Russian government, the Tsar said, this is your rabbi. So they said he's going to give a drosh to the Smedish to see if they're going to approve of him. So they gave him four conditions. that so he has to speak on the parasha, Whatever he says has to be MS, has to be brief, and has to be it's a, a big chiddush. So he got up there and he said, I don't even know which parasha goes this week, and he sat down. <laughs> so the czar said, you got to take him. They said, why? They said, he met all four conditions. <laughs> he spoke about the parasha. What he said was true. It was very brief. It's like a big chiddush that this rough doesn't even know which parasha it is. <laughs> right? And I got to work around. That's what it was. Who am I? I don't want to run away from who I am. I don't have to be. I, 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 I want to understand my life is in the hands of the Rabbi Shalom and my emotional well being, the reality of who I am, given my age, given my position, is I will do the best because this is where God planted me today. I, I, I noticed, you know, I, I, I saw today one of the, one of the papers, uh, there was a, they had a whole thing about World War II. So it was a picture of the New York Times on the day that America dropped the nuclear bomb on Hiroshima. So, you know, the old times, very interesting, those old newspapers. You ever read them? There's like the headline on top, and these like little columns with funny stories. But it's like, President Kennedy was shot, and then there's this article down the middle about someone who lost his golf ball in a window. Like, I think they had ADHD. I, I, honestly, like, like, I would think that, like, what? Martin Shemitah, it's the scene. So, this is what it said. It says, you know, America drops bomb in Hiroshima. I'm trying to read these little columns. Devastated. And on the left side, it says a story about a pilot that was like a great war hero in World War II, and they, you, you could only fly a certain amount of missions, and he wanted to keep flying those missions and knock out those Japanese planes. They said, no, I can't. You flew too many stories. We're taking you back home to America where you're safe. They took him back home to America, and he was killed in, in a plane crash over here in America. Hmm. And there was just Agav. And I was saying, where does that come in with the bombing of the atomic thing, the, the, the Hiroshima <coughs> being bombed? I say, you look at this, you say, nuclear bombs that are falling, whole cities are wiped out, our life isn't worth a penny. So read this article. The Divine decides, 
Okay, exactly where we are, what we are. You can't run away from it. You can't run toward it. Whatever it is, is hashgacha. Stay with it. Now, the lechavitzer so when it came parshas baloyscha, he used to go to the mikvah on Friday with a marching band. And why? Because he was so excited about parshas baloyscha. Why was he so excited about parshas baloyscha? Because it says Hashem diber toy baloyscha. Parshas baloyscha. If you read the parsha carefully goes through this whole range of human emotions from beginning to end. How does the parsha start? We'll go quickly, it's late. Aaron HaKoyin, because it's all really like dumb at the speech, but I want to keep it my own. Aaron HaKoyin, right? The Medrash says, missed his turn to bring one of the Kabbalists. All the Nassim lined up, they all brought their carbon. Now, there's a little bit of a problem. There were only 12, okay? But you really have 13. There's, there's a Friyan because the national of Ephraim broke into two. But then you have Shevet Levi. So really, Aaron is the Nasi of Shevet Levi. He had his cart and ready to go. And then somehow, I don't know what happened, but Ephraim stepped in, took the 12th day, and he was the odd man out. And Aaron felt very bad. And Aaron Hakayim attributed this to the Chet Egel. That's why it wasn't Zeichet to bring a cart. And there's a, there's a Sefer Eitz Yosef from the Tamidim of the Arizal. He said even more. The reason I didn't have the Zerizos to jump in and be marked but it's because God doesn't want my cart. Because of what I did. So what did the Rav Hashem tell Aaron? L'cha g'day l'meshelahem. She'ata madlik u'meitev esenevis. You, you, don't, Aaron, no, no, Aaron! Your light is greater! You're lighting the Menaira! Why is that greater? And the answer is, she'ata madlik u'meitev esenevis. You understand? The Menaira, each night gets extinguished, you relight it. Gets extinguished, you relight it. The Nesim brought the garden, big fanfares, Gavaldik! But you know what you're doing? You are putting a courage! Into Klal Yisrael forever after. They shall light their menorah. It gets extinguished. Oh no, God doesn't like me. What's going to be? And you can relight it and relight it and keep going. And that's in the Moshal and the Medrash. The king comes to visit someone. And the guy had very dim lights. And his servants, so the king came with big bright lights. He said, I'm so embarrassed. So he extinguished all his lights. Let the servants come in with their lights. He walks in and says, where's your lights? He says, I'm so embarrassed. The king says, I have my lights in the palace. I want to eat with your lights. Hashem says, I know who you are. I know what you're worried about now. I know your emotional feelings more than anyone else in the world does. I want to hear your davening, who you are at this given moment. So you have the Levine right afterwards. Their body is shaven. They, they bring the paradum and the karbonis. And Aaron Akhaya lifts 22,000 Nevi'im and he waves them, right? He waves them back and forth and back and forth. So then the Siva Shalom says that means the Nevi'im, the Levi'im had to learn. We're, we're here to help Klal Yisrael, and we have no, I have no control over my life. Wherever, I'll do my best, but wherever I wind up, I wind up, and I'm ready to go. What did they say? This guy came in, uh, you know, he owes the whole, the whole town money, and he comes in with this like $500 esrig, a $600 luluv. And was like, uh huh? You know, and he starts, everyone's standing around him, and he goes to Nuyim, and he goes, Baruch, I know I owe you $800. Yanko, I know you co-signed a loan for me for $500. Shmelka, I know I owe you money. He says, one of the money Shalom knows, I have you all in the air. Goodbye. And he walks out. <laughs> right? the, the, the waving is either I can say, I don't care for anybody, or I can say, the money Shalom, let me do my best. Please help me. You're waving me in this direction, let me understand there's something I have to accomplish over here. You're waving me in this direction, let me understand there's something I have to accomplish over here. And that's followed by Pesach Sheini. You miss a deadline. I missed a deadline. Oh no. You can get mad, walk out. Or you can say, I'm going to knock again, come in. You can come back and say, we're a tummy. We don't want to lose out on the carbon Pesach. You missed, you missed it. That's all. Deadline is over. Please. Please let us in, right? You can have marriages. You know, that's it. You did this, you're finished. You're lost. No, I'm not doing it for you. No, it's end time for You don't want to do it then? No, you're not ready. Sometimes the husband says that. Sometimes the wife says that. You can get mad and say, okay, you're going to say you're going to do it for me. Well, you can do what that guy did. He came, he asked for food. He said, no food. He said, if you don't give me food, I'm going to do what my father did. What did your father do? He says, he went hungry. He said, <laughs> he said you know, that may not be a very good way to run a business, a very good way to run a marriage. So now, right afterwards in Passion of Life, so what do you have? You have the moving of the camps. So very interesting. When they were called together, it was a tekiah, right? Tekiah. When they had to move, it was a trua. What's the difference between a and a trua, right? Trua is, 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 takes a toll on you. Trua means start, stop, start. I don't know where I'm going. I'm driving on the FDR drive. Like, you know, I don't mind if it takes me three hours to get to Muncie. But do me fa- let me sit for three hours and do my work, and then I'll drive 45 minutes to Muncie. Why do I have to go start, stop, start, right? But that's the Nazarian of life. 
That's the truer. Time to move. Start. Move. Start. You have to, you do it. And it comes along with the chatzaitzvahs. And we spoke about this beforehand, what the chatzaitzvahs are. You blow, and you're pressing buttons that stops the airflow. You're blowing, what are you stopping me for? Rabbi Shalom, I want to do this. Why are you stopping me? Because this is the Hatzlacha and Bracha. This is our Nisayin in life. And then you have the Parsha of Ahib and Saya Ari. It doesn't belong here. The things happen in our life. The Rabbi Shalom inserts certain situations in life that we don't understand. You have the two Nuns. They're, they're opposite Nuns. Nun is the Nun Shari Bina. There are things that happen in our life that are exactly the opposite of what we can understand. And then you have the Mesayinim, the craving of Taiva. We're being taken advantage of. It's not fair. Why do we have to eat the man? And then the Lashon Hara of Miriam. Right? Miriam, after all she did for Moshe Rabbeinu, she made a mistake. And she asked, no, no, there's no, you have to pay for the mistake. And you have Moshe Rabbeinu's tefillah for her. Kelna Rafan Allah. And you have all of Kalal Yisrael waiting for Miriam before they're ready to go on. Why are they all waiting for her? I, I made a mistake. I blew it. I spoke Lashon Hara. You made a mistake. Okay, so bounce back. And the Baruch says, I'm waiting for you, I'm waiting for you. And the parasha ends by telling us that Moshe was on of Mikal Adam. And I told you last week, the Vart from Shlom Kizavil. Why was Moshe Rabbeinu on of Mikal Adam? Because Moshe Rabbeinu was shown every generation until Mashiach comes. And if you, I'm going to say you, but if there's a person who can't sleep tonight because he's experiencing a trauma, went through a trauma, or is worried, so if Moshe saw you, and the Rabbi said, look at that yid, this matzav of the Sionis, right in his own house, what's there? The Kalim, the Kalim, Shainim, he's trying so hard, Shakinish Hashem, that was here this, uh, this week that went on over here. That everyone you see, Kalali is saying, we want, we want to try, we're willing to invest so much into, for some people, which is the very essence of their being, that their phone, and, and, and we're, we're willing to cut into it. The Rabbi Nishal said, there's no Messiah, no generation had this Messiah. Moshe Rabbeinu saw this. Moshe Rabbeinu said, I'm humbled. I see that the Messianists of Kali so throughout the generations. I was never tested. Meshavenu sees us. So I want to conclude with this story. The uh, Baba Verov, Sechot Tzadik Lavracha, of Shalom Baba, he was hiding in a bunker in the war. And they were running out of food, and they were running out of air. And one of the people, as an experiment, little, little flame and, and a match, and it kept going out, kept going out. So there's not enough air over here to keep a little fire going. How long could we last like this? And he said, we have to try. So they took a big chance. They opened up the trap door. Let some air come in. Okay, that was the big thing. And there was one person over there. His name was Chaim. He said, I gotta get out of here. 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 So he said, I'm going up. Should they stop him? It looked like he wasn't going to make it. They knew it was dangerous. So he went up. He went up. All he was, he was in his house. Plopped down on the couch. It's after everyone was deported. Just need 10 minutes on the sofa. He wasn't wearing shoes. And as Ashgacha would have it, boom, one of the Hungarian policemen walks in right over there, sees him without shoes. He says, where are the rest of the Jews hiding? I don't know what you're talking about. Where are the rest of the Jews hiding? I don't know what you're talking about. Where are your shoes? I don't know where my shoes are. There's obviously a bunker here. The rest of the Jews are hiding. So he sl slaps him across the face. So he wants to alert the people downstairs. So he begins to howl, scream, at the top of his lungs. He was trying to, ah! You know, he wanted them to hear, and they ran and they closed the door. Imagine what his wife and children felt like. So the, the Baba Varov said that because they, 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 the, the Hungarian police came in, they started stumping around for a hollow place. So the Baba Varov was holding a beam. It's holding a beam under the, under the thing, so when they stamp on it, it shouldn't sound hollow. And a bunch of babies, and they, 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 they're horrible shilas, you have to kill a baby, chas v'shalem, because the Germans will kill everybody if the baby cries, the dinner of a roy day, the pachet is oyim v'noyer. You can imagine how they were sweating then. Somebody comes over to the rub as he's holding this beam. He goes, I want to be macabre something upon myself right now. What should it be like? You know, with a little Tom's thrill in her life. He's like, no, I really, I really, I can be macabre something upon myself. So right now, holding this beam, it's very hard for me to tell you. So I'm not stopping till you tell me. So the rub told him, you know what? He said, Malav Malka. Should wash Malav Malka. What he meant to say was, Matsoi Shabbos. Shabbos is over. A long, dark week ahead. Then we're going to bounce back in, okay? Like, can you sit down? As soon as he said it, the boot stopped, everyone left. Quieted down. The immediate danger was over, but you can imagine the wife and the children of this person. Comes a couple of uh, days later, he's back. This guy's back. He taps the seat. Oh, he opens up. They can't believe he's alive. They say, what happened? He said, they took him into Gestapo headquarters, and uh, they pushed him into a little bathroom, and he saw a window there, and with all of his might, he smashed into the window. Once, twice, it wasn't giving. He said, I'm going to keep trying. I have to keep trying. And boom, he said he slid down a gutter. He said it was a pouring night. 
And he knew that they're not going to come around in the ghetto looking at night. It was pouring. It was empty. Everyone was gone. He said, I got in my hands. I said, thank Hashem that it was pouring so the Germans wouldn't be walking around. And I, on my stomach, I was scared to lift my head. It took me three days to crawl back over here. He said, and I made it back. You know, that wasn't the end of the story. There was a lot more to go. But that's the koyach. The koyach of unbelievable situations. Moshe Rabbeinu says, wow! They had their nesiyanis. Lava Malka is our nesiyanis. Meaning to say, it's not that maybe on this inyan we should all be makabal upon ourselves that uh, so that whoever needs a Yeshua here should have a Yeshua. We should wash him Malava Malka. Because Malava Malka is what we are looking for. It's the show that every mitzvah, every bracha is unique. So this guy who looks very simple, but he said, guess what? I made every Shimon Esrei in my life. I stopped for a moment and I said it in a sweet way. What he was really saying was that all of the emotions in his life he understood not as something that is bogging him down, but as an opportunity to greatness. Oh, yeah.